Listen, I feel like Shyamalan doesn't get enough credit. Like, yeah, he is the dude who duped a lot of people one too many times, and I feel the same way, but this man has carried a secret superhero trilogy that isn't connected to a big franchise, you know? Unlike every other series that's out there, every single installment has a completely different title, which is a ballsy way to pitch that they're connected. And while I do like each one a little less every single time, I'm just so confused yet at the same time intrigued on how he built the final act to this movie and then I believe just butterfingered it. Let me explain. Now we have a whole other video on Split and, and we've talked about it so much that we practically guessed the train twist two years ago and people still tweaking when we're spoiling stuff in the future. But pretty much M. Night's based this series on that incident, the train incident, calling it the East Trail 177 Trilogy. For those who need the unbreakable breakdown, this was like Hitchcock before Hitchcock, but just more dramatic. You got this guy named David Dunn who's like Bob Parr, but less incredible. He has this fear of water since they Jason Voorhees him back in school, until one day he's on the set of Unstoppable and is the only one to survive a deadly train accident. Dude realizes he has superhuman strength, gives people their death, Wish, and then gets surprised when Samuel L. Jackson tells him that he is the one who caused the accident and several others because he's been on the lookout for other superheroes to be his counterpart. Yeah, he gets locked up. Split was an interesting twist because when that ending happened, <laughs> it was only like four people on average in each theater that knew what was going on. Everyone thought they were just there to see James McAvoy get snubbed of an Oscar, the same way John Goodman did. And surprise, it's a sequel to the one Shyamalan movie that isn't as prolific. In it, a kid named Kevin is dealing with DID when his dad decides to take a train to get more info on it and gets bandersnatched. This causes his mama to go crazy and treat him like a child, called it, causing him to create these alter personalities in order to protect them, and together they're known as the Horde. But the big one that's trying to take over, the one that turns him into a villain, is the Beast who collects other people who he doesn't believe have suffered enough. It's a pretty interesting psychology, and you realize it's all part of a Shyamalan superhero movie. So while Kevin and all of his other minion names that he has is able to get away by the end of that one, David then starts hunting him down, Glass starts orchestrating a plan, and Shyamalan is able to make his third and final sequel. Now, I've mentioned Identity before when talking about this series, and if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about with the same feeling that they both have. Pretty much the whole movie takes place at this facility after these two get caught touching each other. You got this lady who's trying to convince them that they're not superheroes, even though David Dunn bent steel and this other dude looks like he took Viagra for his body, yet she's super convinced that it's all in their minds, that they're like cosplayers who just never take off the costumes. Dunn Jr. is then on the sidelines trying to prove that his dad was just seeing things the whole time. Anya Taylor-Joy is trying to reenact Beauty and the Beast as she touches Kevin making him crumble, but little does everyone know that Elijah, who you know the movie's based on, is ready to fly over the cuckoo's nest. That's probably because he doesn't appear till an hour into this movie. Now, I've always liked the deconstruction that movies have when it deals with the superhero genre, right? And Unbreakable was one of the first to do it, but since then, we've had a lot. So I'm not hating on the idea of mimicking the third act climax, right? But this did feel a lot like BVS when they tried to make them fight in front of everybody. Of course, my money was on the beast because, you know, that dude still has like three levels to digivolve while David's done. But then at the end, everyone dies. Now listen, we all know Shyamalan loves this twist. It would actually be a twist if there was no twist. But to have two twists, just twist the twist you're going for. Like I said, Kevin's dad being on the train, meaning that Elijah was the guy who created him as the villain, I think was an obvious theory the same way R plus L was way back then. But the fact that there's this whole adjustment bureau for superheroes was crazy. Like somehow Shyamalan was able to introduce this really cool concept Yet, in my opinion, flop it at the same time. I mean, the idea that there are superheroes out there, but a secret society has been making sure to keep them under wraps is dope. The idea that they've gathered together all of these people and have been playing these psychological games because instead of killing these superheroes or these supervillains, they've tried to go the peaceful route of convincing them that they have a condition. That's interesting because when you compare it to other superhero movies where you have civil wars and they start making a big deal that when you have these really strong superheroes, it's only going to cause other villains to come out. The idea that Batman only exists because of the Joker and the Joker exists because of Batman. Thus, the reason that they're here is because they want to make sure that that chaos doesn't get out of order. 
So how in the hell did they get duped by a man in a wheelchair? You're telling me that for tens of thousands of years, this group has been hiding all imagery, all news reports, not even a hieroglyph slipped, but a guy named Mr. Glass, cause he's so frail, is able to live stream this whole battle on his Twitch account? Bruh, you had a whole group of people eating at the same time, that's how orchestrated y'all were. Why did you leave one employee watching the three of these people? Like, you guys didn't even put in a guard, right? Y'all left a minimum wage employee who, who gladly opened the door for these two to escape like there was no problem. Y'all were the ones who set up the cameras for him. And I never get this with movies, but you ever see when they set up a camera and the person is able to get to the camera and, like, rearrange everything that's in there, even though the camera would have caught them going? Does nobody have, like, the footage getting streamed to their phones with a, I don't know, detector going off i'm surprised that rocky and bullwinkle didn't blow this group's cover again it's a really cool idea but when you have a movie that takes the time to emphasize on super little details like the multiple toothbrushes for the multiple personalities it just makes me wonder how you miss these glaring things that make this group crumble i mean y'all even digitally removed the tattoos in the trailer so we wouldn't catch on what happened? At this point, I'm just pretty much convinced that any third movie that's dealing with a clover is just a no-go, so I'm just questioning where it goes from here. I personally think Shyamalan is done with the trilogy, but just like the Saw series and Insidious and many other ones, just because the main people who did the trilogy are done, uh, producers come in and they expand it with a bunch more. I personally would love to see Anish from Searching Direct one because he's clearly a big M. Night fan. He's already working with Sarah Paulson on another movie, so it sounds like something he can expand upon, but I can definitely see this universe becoming an anthology series. Obviously, I would love to see it as a miniseries, but the fact that there's been all of these different superhero stories all over the world in this universe that have been suppressed by this group means that you have so many different tales and so many options to go with it. Either way, while I have liked every little movie a little less, I still think M. Night has created something really interesting, something that can be really expanded upon, but it's very clear that the more sequels you add to a franchise like this, the more fragile it gets. Thank you guys for checking out this video, I'm curious to know your thoughts in the comment section. Like I said, those four movies that I had mentioned, the, the four shows, I'm still working on those. Some people forget how long it takes to edit a video over here, but we've been doing a, a little road trip down the west coast leading up to Sundance, that's where we're at now, so know that the videos are going to be stilted a little bit, maybe the editing will be a little backed up until we cover everything at the film festival, which of course we're going to do a Let Me Explain on, as well as everything else that we're missing up on, to just play catch up in a sense, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on this film, let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Out of the three which is your favorite. Like I said, for me, it goes Unbreakable, then it goes Split, then it goes Glass. I like parts of each. Uh, I don't hate Glass like a lot of people are. For those of you who missed it in the beginning, I personally give it a solid rent it. The thing is, it's just, it falls apart at the end, man. Like, I had no idea that a majority of it took place in a facility, uh, but just the fact that you have such an interesting concept with this group, and then they just get duped. I don't know, man. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe and etc.